Welcome to Chapter 7. We are looking at public opinion and persuasion today. We're going to talk about what public opinion is, how mass media and conflict can play a role, and then persuasion and its impact. Let's start with what public opinion is. Now, in order to understand its impact and the amount of impact that public opinion can have on a public relations campaign, you really need to know how it works. So let's give a, pre, a brief overview. There are three basic aspects about public opinion formation, so how it forms. Society in general tends to be passive. Now obviously they can be active with certain things as we talked about last PowerPoint, but in general society is passive when it comes to imagery and or advertisement of some sort. In addition to that, it is very segmented. As you probably know, certain groups need certain things and certain groups want certain things or have certain amounts of knowledge. So it is a very segmented audience. The society in general is going to be segmented in a way in which some groups are going to be wholly unnecessary or unneeded for your public relations campaign, while others are absolutely vital. And then finally, it is divided. So even within the segmented groups, let's say we segment by age, within those age groups, there are divisions. So society is <laughs> difficult in that it is very passive, it's very segmented, and it can be quite divided even within segmentation. So there are some strategies and some necessities that you have to keep in mind. Because to be perfectly honest, public opinion is incredibly powerful. And oftentimes, getting your audience to do, think, purchase, whatever, your product or your company or to think about your group in a certain way, you have to activate that through the use of public opinion. So identifying those key publics and analyzing them and understanding them in order to fully comprehend public opinion you have to be able to get through quite a few things to analyze that group, to analyze its needs, its wants, its desires, and its passive or active state. Now once you have an idea of who your public is, you will come to find that there are oftentimes what's called opinion leaders. Now they can be very formal opinion leaders, groups that have a designated expertise and they are interested and impactful on a specific issue. So that might be, let's say, a charity. And it's an, let's say your group is a uh, oil company and an opinion leader is a charity that is anti-oil company. So that could be a very formal opinion leader or you can have more informal opinion leaders and that's actually grown quite a bit over the last six seven years as social media has grown there have become more and more informal public opinion leaders than there used to be so we see a lot of that happening on social media via YouTube and uh, Facebook and such they are usually pretty darn knowledgeable on their subject and very interested in it and can tend to push people in one direction or the other. They are the catalysts. So if you look, if you follow anybody on Twitter that's an expert in your field or an expert in something you're interested in or maybe you are following a page on Facebook or you watch a lot of YouTube videos on a particular topic, you'll notice that the same people tend to pop up over and over and over again and that can be a big catalyst for opinions on your subject. Now the flow of opinion can happen in a lot of different ways and your book discusses that. I'm not going to go into detail because there's a really good chart in your book if you take a look at it. But in general, the way opinions are developed can differ based on the topic or based on the region or based on its history. So there's a lot of ways in which opinion can change. But what you really need to know is that there are opinion leaders out there and they can absolutely be major catalysts for your public relations campaign. It can catapult you into the place you want to be or in an exact opposite direction. So understanding these opinion leaders is kind of a big deal. Now apart from opinion leaders, we also have the mass media, which we've talked about a few times. I mean, you think of things like uh, journalists writing news releases, or not writing news releases, but delivering news releases and or uh, advertising campaigns, those are all part of mass media, the media that is delivered to the masses. 
via television, radio, internet, websites, and such. Now in mass media, there are some things that you want to keep in mind. Now these two here are general theories about how media can impact a message. And I want to finish or spend a bit of my time talking to you about agenda setting theory. Now framing is definitely an issue if you think about how information is formed or presented it's typically framed in a certain way. So the media can choose to emphasize one thing and de-emphasize something else and therefore lead you to believe that the most important part of the message is the one thing that they emphasized. Now that is a very important issue but before you can even get to that you have to consider agenda setting. The media actually tells the public what to think about not necessarily what to think, but they tell you what to think about. So they may not tell you what to think, but they are going to tell you what to think about. What does that mean? That means that it is up to the media to decide what information to present in the first place. And once they decide what information to present, then they can go into framing. So the agenda setting theory is quite impactful if you really think about it how do you determine what is news, what is important, or what specifically about that news is important? Well, oftentimes if you get your news or you get your information from, say, a Facebook feed for a particular news broadcasting station, or maybe you actually read the news on your iPad or Flipboard, or maybe you actually get a newspaper, shockingly enough, you never know. Those kinds of things can lead you to form opinions in a particular way based on how the media presents the information or whether or not they choose to present it at all. So that's a huge deal and that's something to keep in mind not only as a critical viewer of media or consumer of media, but definitely as a PR rep. You have to make sure your message gets out there in a way that is presented accurately. Now in some cases, once that information is presented or maybe not presented, you can experience some conflict. And conflict does add its own level to the way the information is either persuasive in one direction or another. So conflict is inherent in, in public relations campaigns. And you can use conflict to form a whole new opinion of your client or to solidify an opinion or such. And conflict always connects itself to persuasion. So you can choose what you do with that conflict. Do you decide to bury your head in the sand as a PR campaign or as a PR rep and try to hide from the conflict? Well, that on its own is going to lead you to persuade your audience in one direction. Or are you going to decide that instead of burying your head in the sand, you are going to present a, a full awareness of what went wrong and you're going to uh, accept responsibility. Uh, for example, the other night we went to a restaurant and had horrible service. Now we had been attending this restaurant for decades and this was the worst service I've ever seen. And I'm not sure what happened. I don't know if it was a, a holiday evening and they were just overbooked and understaffed or what happened. But my family sent an email saying how shocked we were the behavior of the staff and what happened and the owner could have sent an email back saying hey you know it was a holiday evening we were doing the best we could I'm sorry you had a hard time but honestly we we're trying very hard thank you for your concern and left it at that and we probably would have felt fine but maybe a little disenfranchised a little irritable but that's not what the owner did the owner actually sent an email saying we screwed up we, we messed up completely. I can't believe that you had this experience. We know you're a good quality customer that comes back over and over and over again, and we don't want to lose you. Here's a free meal. So they really owned up to their mistake. So that can make a difference as to how your audience is persuaded to believe one way or another the opinions that they hold strongly to for your company. Now, persuasion can be used to change or neutralize hostile, hostile opinions. It can crystallize latent opinions, bring them to the surface, solidify them, or they can help to maintain favorable opinions. Well, in that example I just gave you, we could have changed to a hostile opinion, 
based on her response, the owner's response. But instead, we maintained a favorable opinion of the company, of the restaurant. Now, in persuasive communication, there are a lot of factors, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because your text goes into this. But these things together can factor into whether a message is persuasive or not. And just a quick overview of a few of them. Oftentimes when you are trying to be persuasive, whether it's in a PR situation or it is in a personal situation or a professional circumstance, um, be it uh, public speaking or per um, per PR or what have you, sorry, I'm stumbling there. Regardless of what the situation is, these appeals can make a difference. So for example, if you're trying to get your audience to think, feel, or believe something, oftentimes you're going to appeal to their self-interest. What benefit do they get from your message? What's in it for them? That's a common argument. When you're trying to be persuasive, you've got to ask yourself, what is in it for them? What do they get out of this? But before you can ever do that, you have to know what they need in the first place. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a good starting place. Take a look at it if you find yourself interested in the idea of persuasion. You have to follow in Maslow's hierarchy, you have to follow steps and meet the most basic needs first. If those basic needs are met, then you can move up to the more complex needs. And you form your message, you form your arguments around those needs and those will appeal to their self-interest. And even though you've got usually a public of thousands or even hundreds of thousands or even millions, even though you've got that large of a public, you can still generalize for the most part through research you can solidify this information, but you can generalize what level of need your audience will typically have for that particular public. Now audience participation is also a factor here. Um, workers that are involved in the problem solving that will help you to lead your public relations campaign in the right direction is very beneficial. So if you're trying to get this image to be presented correctly, maybe you involve those that work for the company to help solve the problem of whatever wherever your image is. Or maybe you are selling a product and you are trying to get more representation for that product. You want more people to know about it. Well, you could possibly distribute samples. If you've ever looked at the reviews on Amazon, many of those received samples. There's also a company that does a lot of this. It's called, I think it's called Biz Agent or Buzz Agent or something like that, where they you sign up and you are sent samples of things based on your your audience demographics, so who you are. And then you were supposed to review those things. Well, that's distribution of samples. And then again, all these other things that can play a part here, the act of participation encouraged by activist groups, so you know you've got this formal opinion leader out there. You can encourage them by um, funding maybe some kind of activist campaign or participating in a fundraiser of some sort. All of those kind of connect to your audience and its own form of persuasion. Now also keep in mind that when you do ask your audience to do something, when you have decided that, hey, I want them to take this particular action, recommendations for action need to be clear. They need to be very direct. You have to give, just like your objectives from a couple of weeks ago, you have to be very specific. You have to say, here is exactly what I want you to do. And the person that says that, that asks you to do whatever it is you want them to do, has to have its own sense of credibility. So either the company itself who is representing this call to action, or if you have somebody that is in an ad campaign for you, say a celebrity or such, that person has to be seen as having expertise, to be very sincere with what they have to say, not fake, and have some level of charisma, that they're not boring or drawn out. So this is where you have the balance between whether you hire a celebrity who may or may not have expertise and may or may not have sincerity, but certainly likely has charisma, or do you hire somebody who is an actual person that has used your product or what have you, or had experience with it, and then those do have expert expertise and sincerity, but maybe not so much charisma. So that's something to consider based on your situation. And whatever message you're trying to get across, the public relations practitioner should always ask themselves a couple of questions. 
Will the audience understand the message I'm trying to get across? And what do I want them to do with the message? So again, think back to the action that you are trying to portray to your audience and be very clear and very specific about that action. And then a couple of other things to keep in mind are some of the ways in which you can structure messages. Here is a list of some of the options and you'll notice we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But these are some of the ways in which you can persuade your audience. And then through these channels, those persuasive messages can be delivered. So we said here that you could say, for example, um, use an emotional appeal, a story from a child who has had an experience with a charity. So that's your emotional appeal to your audience. Well, then you can take that emotional appeal and put it on, the telev on television or on social networking sites and deliver that information. And then finally, timing and context, excuse me. Timing and context is part of how you determine what is the appropriate situation in which to deliver the, the persuasive message. And that's really going to depend on your audience and its needs. And once you decide what the audience's needs are, then you can determine what situation is appropriate for the delivery of this message. You're obviously not going to present a Christmas message in July. That's not necessary. You're not going to do Toys for Tots in July. It just wouldn't fit timing wise. And then reinforcement. A public relations campaign should be in sync with an audience's core value or belief system. Now that's hard. You want to reinforce your message. You want to make sure it sticks to them. And so you have to keep in mind that you are establishing need. You are making sure you are hitting their needs, their self-interest, and you are reinforcing that need. Now, oops, excuse me. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about here is the limits of persuasion. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's just something I want you to think about. While persuasive techniques are well established and you hear about them everywhere and you can read whole books written by professionals on persuasion, there are limits to it. I mean, if you think about right now and um, in any future situation in which there might be a political campaign, obviously you've got a competing set of messages. One group saying one thing, another group saying another, and so on. But there are other factors to it as well. So hopefully this was a nice brief, <laughs> as brief as I could make it, overview of persuasion and public opinion. And if you have questions or comments, there's much more detail in your text, as well as if you have any questions of me, you can certainly come ask me. Have a great week, guys.